everyone. Hello, Yasmina. Thank you so much for joining this Launch Metrics um, presentation conference talk. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much, Jessica, and thank you so much for the team of Launch Metrics for the invitation. Well, let's dive right in because everybody's here to learn all about um, what it takes to break into the, the region and the, the luxury space here in uh, Dubai, Saudi, the entire GCC. And I guess the first thing I wanted to ask you, it's kind of a generic question, but I think it needs answering, which is what would you say are the biggest misconceptions that the rest of the luxury world has about the Middle East consumer? I think if I look at back, especially maybe, you know, pre-COVID and if we anchor in on 2019, I think the typical misconceptions that the, the, the rest of the world had about Middle East, that it's a market which is kind of a bit following the rest of the world. Um, so there were big trends shaping shaped um, historically in Europe, then in US, then also Asia took over. And the Middle East usually was perceived as a follower. Uh, even when you look at the annual reports of any of the uh, of the fashion houses, it's usually rest of the world, the ROW, where Middle East is kind of club. Um, and then with the COVID and with really positive management of the of the situation in the Middle East, um, we were one of the first areas, especially United Arab Emirates and Dubai, one of the first um, areas of the world which opened up um, to the boot tourism as well as events. And we saw really a large number of, um, of events being organized, which has kind of put Middle East on the map of the world. So from a region that maybe was at one point perceived as a, as a follower, uh, we, we kind of now have a situation when Middle East is more, at one point was in the center and now it's a, um, Dubai in particular is almost like a fashion capital of the world. We see it when we do consumer studies a lot, uh, where we had a consumer that was very traditional, um, very spontaneous, um, very, uh, very uh, not willing to stand out. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we used to see before. Now, when we ask the consumer how they shop and when, when we observe their behavior, they're much more willing to explore. They're willing to innovate. They're looking at cool brands, trendy brands that have not maybe been popular somewhere else uh, three or five years ago. So really being at the forefront. And what's also fantastic is we finally see some also brands uh, being born in the region and going and trying to conquer the world. So really a different Middle East than maybe we would have seen um, in uh, when it comes to luxury and in particular fashion um, a few years ago. Okay, great. So everything is looking up here for the region and we're standing on our own two feet and telling our own story out to the rest of the world. And we're no longer followers, but leaders. Love it and absolutely agree with that's what I'm seeing here on the ground in Dubai. Um, if say I'm a luxury brand and I want to penetrate the region, I want to start here. What would you say is the biggest mistake um, any luxury brand makes when they try and enter the market? So um, I think there are, you know, uh, many. I'm not sure if mistakes, but learnings that we have from the from the previous years. Mm. First one is that we usually talk about Middle East. Middle East um, is a very broad region. There are more than ten countries in the Middle East. And even usually people, when they refer to Middle East, especially in luxury and fashion, they mean um, GCC, so yeah. uh, Gulf, uh, Gulf Co uh, Cooperation Council. That's six countries still, so roughly um, the size of Italy uh, when it comes to GDP and population of about 60 million people, but six different countries with very different tastes, different geography, different retail footprint, um, uh, different demographics. You, talk, you look at Dubai, which has... Uh, maybe 80% expat, expats, and you look at Saudi, where the nationals consist, uh, comprise about 70% of the population of the country. So very, very different um, specifics, and many brands think about Middle East as a one-size-fits-all approach, where all these countries are perceived just like one, one, one thing. Um, and we see very different uh, countries, very different consumers, retail landscape. I think that's maybe number one thing that, that we kind of maybe want to demystify today, that usually entering Middle East is requires a tailored approach for each of the countries uh, where you enter. And we can obviously discuss what's the right sequence to enter uh, between the United Arab Emirates versus Jordan versus uh, Saudi Arabia versus Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, and so on. Um, mm -hmm. So that's maybe uh, point number one. Second thing that the brands some struggle to understand is that while we are, we're living in a global world and it's very important to have your own um, brand, uh, brand values, brand sentiment, uh, brand uh, 
voice of the brand, yeah. brand identity, exactly. Um, we actually see that there is some customization uh, needed. And you know, we can talk about local, we can talk about global, or we can talk about something in between. Uh, but um, understanding how do you customize from Middle East is also very important. Uh, mm -hmm. We obviously don't want any luxury brand to lose their identity, but understanding that if you're entering Saudi Arabia, you cannot have your web page in English because less than 30% of visits to pages um, or uh, Google searches are done in English. They're mostly still done in Arabic. So therefore you need to have certain level of localization to, uh, to address the market. That's maybe um, number two. And then third one is the service. We have a very well-traveled consumer. Middle mm. East is not anymore a place where you open your kind of a, a tier C store. Um, it's a place where many global bla uh, brands have flagships because about 60 to 70% of the luxury consumer in Middle East travels at least once per quarter to some of the other regions. So typically it's Europe. And for when we talk about uh, luxury or shopping in general, it's Paris and London. So they do see the fantastic stores on New Bond Street. They see fantastic you know, stores in Avenue Montaigne or in, in, in San Honoré. So they know what to expect and they expect the same level of, um, of retail experience and service provided by the staff in the Middle East. These are maybe some of the things that come to mind of what were um, some of the learnings we had over the years or misconceptions that we had to kind of um, explain and introduce to many of the global brands entering the region? Well, I mean, I, those are all such great points. And I think we're going to drill down um, into a few of those going forward. Uh, you talked about, you know, targeting the different countries uh, for a luxury brand. Uh, when we're talking about actually entering the market, those kind of crucial first steps, is it really deciding which country? Do you think that the smart move, just because of the maturity of the market, it's the UAE that most luxury brands should start in? Or should it be somewhere like Saudi, where we're seeing such a young youth quake, and maybe that's the right area to be, to be going in? I know that so many luxury brands right now are incredibly excited about Saudi in particular? So typical path that most brands have taken is to enter first in United Arab Emirates um, and usually it's Dubai. Um, then usually they would go to Kuwait, then maybe Qatar, not, uh, not all of them are there. And then, and then only then Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has for years been quite unexplored. Today, when we think about how is a global, global brand you would enter the market, I still think Dubai is usually a number one place where brands enter, simply because it's a more um, a diverse population and it's a combination of both locals and tourists. So if you're not sure if your brand would appeal necessarily to local, to residents, to local communities, maybe you know it will appeal to a variety of tourists that are coming to the country. So it's kind of a safer bet because especially if you have a global brand, it's, it's, it's easier to address the market. Um, when we talk about other markets, uh, interesting is that Many of the brands to these days also look at, at Kuwait as number one, in particular when we talk about very trendy and non-traditional brands, because our Kuwaiti consumer has been for years known um, as someone who appreciates um, kind of innovation, being at the forefront of fashion, being more... Um, uh, more uh, willing to risk a type of you know uh, silhouettes that they wear and so on. So it was it, it's typically a market where if you're a bit more kind of avant-garde to to call it that way brand, you would maybe consider Kuwait first. Um, Saudi, I, I cannot think of a single brand that has entered Saudi before other markets. To be honest, I have seen it extensively recently, for example, in food and beverage. But when you talk about fashion, um, that hasn't been the case yet. And we do see a bit more like kind of safe option to first go into Dubai, create a bit of buzz around the brand and build a clientele and only then um, only then enter Saudi. What's also interesting for UAE that about 30% of foreigners who shop in UAE luxury are actually Saudis. Um, so even opening in Dubai, you kind of given a glimpse and depending how you see your, your, um, your uh, customers, who your customer is in Dubai, um, if there is a lot of Saudis, then typically brands will go into Saudi. Yet... Mm -hmm. Saudi is the biggest market in the Middle East. Saudi Arabia is a 30 million people population, um, actually closer to 35. Uh, and uh, it is by far the largest country, the largest population, and the one where we think the biggest growth will be in the future. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely agree with that. And I also agree with um, your, your conversation, which you said about Kuwait, because I, I visited it twice now, and I have just been floored by the individuality of style and sophistication of the eye of the women of Kuwait. It's its impressive, um, more daring than many European cities, actually, in, in my humble opinion. 
Um, one of the other things that really stood out since I've moved to Dubai, uh, the region, is the level of service here is unparalleled to anything that I've seen anywhere else in the world. Uh, how, let's talk a little bit about the service aspect of it and how brands can really incorporate this, whereas you can sometimes you can walk into stores in, um, you know, as a capital city in the European Union and feel like you're being looked down upon or or things close on Sundays or what what have you. There seems to be very much this catering in this in this area here in the in the region that it doesn't exist maybe in the rest of the world. But I'll let you talk about what that element of service and how important that is to success for a luxury brand here. Yeah, absolutely. So I do think that when it comes to service, um, we generally have even better experience in the Middle East than, than in some other maybe more developed uh, developed parts of the world. It, it is cultural because there is a culture of hospitality in the Middle East. So it is quite usual to come to a store in any of the countries in the Middle East and being offered water, being offered coffee, being given some you know snacks or sweets, uh, mm -hmm. typically while you shop. In Europe, you will have it in some places, but not the others. Here, it's kind of a norm. Even if you go to brands, what we would call accessible luxury, you will be offered at least um, coffee and water when you come to, to buy something, which um, in many European countries wouldn't happen. Um, there is also, and I do think it's anchored in the in the in the hospitality or or, or generally culture of the of the of the region. Also, because the shopping patterns or the way people shop are different. Um, in Europe, um, and I'm originally from Europe, um, when I go, I usually don't like to be bothered. So I go in a store, I see what I like, I try it, I take it, I leave the store. Um, here, very often, um, both female and male consumers, um, they like to go to a store, they sit down on a sofa, they try different things, they talk. Usually they will be shopping in, in kind of um, a couple, a few people together in crowds. Uh, they will sit down, they will try many different models, and then they will, and then they will purchase. Um, that whole journey usually takes a bit longer, and it's maybe, um, I wouldn't call it slower, but it's kind of more personal, and it's less, less transactional. Um, mm -hmm. And the impression you make when it comes to the service is usually what makes the customer come back. Mm -hmm. um, so I think th these are some of the things that obviously what you mentioned, store work stores working um, uh, the whole week, seven days a week, uh, also being open very late, especially when you have, um, you know, summers, which are pretty harsh in the Middle East. So it's very hard to be uh, to be outside. You go to malls that are open very long, fantastic food and beverage um, uh, offering in the malls. So really a place where where, where people like to hang around and um, and then eventually also purchase. What I think, though, is interesting is when you talk about the service, while I think overall it's fantastic, um, I think maybe one thing that's kind of lacking is sometimes when it comes to our frontliners, the ability for to provide styling um, mm -hmm. service. So I always give an example when you go to some of the stores um, in Europe and then um, the, the, the fashion advisors. Um, try to understand your style and then come back from the warehouse with a, you know, a, a full uh, hanger full of uh, basically different options corresponding to what I think you might like. I think here, maybe we're not yet there, where I think that when it comes to personal styling of each and every fashion advisor, maybe we are not yet um, on that level. Uh, but when it comes generally as a service and hospitality, I do think we're we are ahead. Also, one thing worth mentioning is that all stores in the Middle East have very luxurious VIP salons, um, yes. which, um, which in Europe you will find in some occasions, but not as much. Again, it's partially cultural because uh, in particular for women, uh, for coming from more traditional backgrounds, they do prefer to shop um, in a in a kind of segregated, separate space, not being so much um, in the in the open, especially if they're veiled and they need to remove the veil and so on. So um, I think uh, that also has been driving a bit of uh, the experience that happens in some of the VIP and private salons. Yeah, I agree. The, I was recently at the reopening of the the Fendi store in the Dubai Mall, and they had three separate stunningly different and gorgeous salons with you know marble floors and, and everything and then I also would just add on to that that I would say that the the service aspect you know in terms of technology the the direct communication via whatsapp is also unparalleled in the region everything is everything is functional through whatsapp here um we mentioned earlier about you know the Kuwaiti women being incredibly forward thinking with with their design you know there was a time where in in China and in the Middle East where it was all about the logo it was all about you know recognizable wealth where are we in, on the scale now where wanting to buy local and support local designers or buying niche or under the radar designers this idea of more of that personal style or is it still all about the big names the big brands and being recognized you know that forward facing recognition of of wealth. 
I think we have a combination of that in some markets, such as Kuwait, for example, we would have uh, people exploring more um, with uh, with kind of new upcoming upcoming brands. While in some markets, maybe um, uh, best example is Saudi Arabia, we do see, see, still see a lot of dominance from a large brand from the large brands. It's interesting in the recent consumer study of the luxury consumer in Saudi Arabia, we asked them when was the first time you bought a luxury item. And 50% of the consumers in our pretty large sample bought the first luxury item um, less than a year ago. Um, so that basically shows the amount of new luxury consumer that's constantly coming into the market or the premiumization of the market that we see, um, which, which essentially means when you have a new customer, you typically will go for recognizable brands because then it also represents a bit of a, a, bit of a social status. Mm -hmm. However, on some areas, we do not see uh, global brands yet entering and or, or playing, and this is where the, the local brands are uh, very strong. So, for example, when we talk about more traditional or modest wear, you mm -hmm. have rarely any of the global players playing in the space. You would have the likes of Valentino doing an, or Dolce & Gabbana doing an Abaya collection, but that's still more sporadic, and that mm -hmm. space is dominated by, by the local brands, and we have um, some fantastic local brands such as Manal Al Hamadi, for example, which is known for her very luxurious abayas, and you know uh, people usually call it the the Hermes of of of, of abayas. So you mm -hmm. do have those brands coming from the region, but we also see interestingly people liking uh, brands in athleisure, for example. We have a few examples. Maybe the Giving Movement is the obvious one, which is a local athleisure brand, which has became very popular, and it's coming from the region, and people actually are proudly wearing a product that has a um, um uh, that says uh, made in the UAE so yeah and it, the giving movement like really written right all over it out there for everyone to see right. correct so, so it doesn't necessarily need to be any more global brands but on average if you were to compare it to some of the other markets I was actually recently in uh, in uh, end of November in Japan yes indeed you will probably see more logos here uh, in Middle East than you would see um in maybe some of the Asian markets or, or or Europe in particular if you go to France it's not that common especially with the local uh, local folks so yeah uh, it's a developing market I think we're going through a a bit of a maturity uh, curve of maturity same as uh, what maybe some other markets have gone before mm -hmm. and what about so Clearly, luxury has penetrated, you know, the region quite significantly. Is there an area of luxury or um, in, in general, where do you think that there's still an area to be explored or there's still uh, a penetration to be made in terms of if you're a new brand wanting to break out? Uh, is there an area that really hasn't been mined completely and where you can kind of get a foothold in now as opposed to uh, in the past? So I think I think when we talk about maybe beauty, I think the the beauty space have been uh, has been quite developed, and we see it also in the mix of the country. So, for example, when we look at the the prestige beauty space, including some of the indie brands, but maybe a bit more with a bit more uh, higher price point, we see, for example, a very proportionate uh, size of the market across each of the countries. For example, Saudi is bigger than UAE, which is what you would expect given that it's a bigger country. When we mm -hmm. talk about the fashion, um, I think we see maybe some of the markets such as Saudi being a bit lagging behind uh, in a sense that uh, UAE, even though it's a way smaller country, uh, three, four times smaller, has um, three times or even four times bigger uh, fashion, uh, high end fashion market in Saudi Arabia. So we do see more opportunity currently in fashion, given that we do not see it yet on the same level of maturity. One mm -hmm. area which is probably the um, the area with the most potential is the watches and jewelry space, in particular jewelry category, mm -hmm. uh, because in the Middle East, typically 70% of jewelry bought was traditional jewelry, gold, uh, bought in the souks um, and in a, what we would call maybe unstructured channel all from the, or from the local brands. So really... Um, modern jewelry, um, and I think, you know, we can talk about brands such as, I don't know, Messica or Maria Tash on, on that maybe positioning, have been doing really well on the market. Uh, we see the whole jewelry actually segment doing well, but uh, some of these, you know, there's more space for maybe innovative uh, jewelry concepts in the market. And I think this is where the more shift will be happening. Besides organic growth of the market, also shift from unbranded to branded is, um, is what we see. Okay. So one of the things that I, I find so fascinating about speaking with you is because the wealth of knowledge you have, not just in this particular region, but you've been everywhere. Let's be honest. Look, your, your resume is impressive. You spent, you know, 20 years working in the industry, in the luxury space. You've traveled in Europe and Asia, and of course here in the Middle East. 
what we talked a, a touch at this at the beginning, but what for you, when you're looking across the world, what sets this region apart amongst all the others? Uh, if we think about luxury, what sets this region apart is that we have a consumer that really, really likes luxury and enjoys luxury. We mm -hmm. have in Qatar, the consumer that is number one globally when it comes to luxury spending per capita. We have consumers, um, Middle East, uh, recently I spoke to one of the top brands who told me that 6% of their spending in Europe is actually a Middle Eastern consumer. If you look at the population of Middle East versus the world, it's way less. So we do have a consumer that appreciates quality, not just when it comes to fashion, when it comes to homeware as well. They like to have um, uh, nicely decorated homes. Uh, they like to have uh, you know beautiful decorative pieces, crystal or, uh, or silver um, or um, you know uh, porcelain. So really quality pieces and a consumer that generally generally um, um, respects luxury for the heritage and for uh, and for history that it has. And recently, I spoke to one of my uh, neighbors. Um, who is actually Kuwaiti, and she's been showing me her collection in, his, in her closet, and I've been telling her, wow, it's full. Uh, are you looking maybe to resell some of the pieces? Um, mm. And she said, oh, no, that's that's like my 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 goal. Like, you know, in the old days, um, our, um, our, um, our our family or, you know, our grandparents would collect gold or pearls. For me, this is, this is you know, um, this is something close to my heart and I want to keep it forever. And I really think we have a, we have a customer that really lives and breathes uh, luxury in the Middle East. I really believe that's something that sets us apart. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. The the level of sophistication, the eye of the the consumer here, you ca they can't be bamboozled or fooled. They really do understand what luxury is. And as much as they're buying, you know, new abayas for you know every day of Ramadan, there also seems to be this idea of you know changing your interior decor almost as much as you're changing your wardrobe, which I find incredibly impressive. I have to say um, that that's going on. So when you're with, when looking forward now, um, and then we're going to open this up to questions because there seem to be a ton. Um, two things. Where do you think, what's the pain point going forward um, for the Middle East um, in general in the luxury space? And what are you most excited about? So what are, let's do both sides of the coin. Of course. Um, I think if I look at what's, what's one of the maybe um, painful areas is that we are kind of plateauing when it comes to the uh, real estate space. So in Europe, um, most of the, or in US, most of the sales happens in, uh, luxury sales happens in the cities. And cities are usually bigger. Huh? So you can just take an extra building. You can take a street, you know, in, the, in that corner street and so on. So there's a bit of an organic expansion if you need more space. In Middle East, sales happens in malls. And malls mm -hmm. have only that size. And you cannot just add a piece up to the mall because you want to open three or five more stores. And that's our biggest limitation. In Dubai, we've hit um, full occupancy in all the top malls. Um, mm -hmm. In Saudi Arabia, we have wait lists from many brands for each and every location in the malls. So to really develop the retail experience, um, brands that are doing well want bigger spaces. They want to be able to, you know, open a cafe. They want to be able to maybe bring hot couture on, on top of ready to wear um, and be running out of space. So I think that's one of the things that's a bit of a frustration. There's so much interest and it's it's been really, really hard to accommodate everyone um, and give everyone, you know, the space they deserve because it's very hard to give a customer experience they have in Paris or London if we cannot give them the, the right, uh, you know, ecosystem or the right place in the mall space um, and everything else to have that experience. And we really are looking to make the experience um, uh, as close or better to what they have um, in other places, which they often uh, travel to so they know what to expect. Um, what I'm mostly ex excited about, I'm actually very excited about how we see the market outside of Dubai developing because there has been really a lot of focus on Dubai in the last years. Um, and I'm really looking forward to see how this will develop beyond Dubai. Hi, so sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
I apologize. I I don't know my Wi-Fi dropped out. So I I heard the the difficulty about not having a space to enough space to accommodate as as a a luxury brand would want to be accommodated in the region. Which and before you go on to you know what's exciting you about, man, I just want to do a little tangent there and say and talk briefly about then the internet and that aspect of shopping, especially post pandemic. How has that changed? If we can't have the space in the stores, especially as the service, everything is. I know that you know everything can be brought to your door within two hours. Talk to me a little bit about that aspect of how and how that's changed here in with the luxury space. So I think you know e-commerce in the Middle East is um, uh, smaller than what it is in the rest of the world. Um, if you look at formal official e-com numbers, um, so I think we're currently in high fashion at about eighteen percent, which is below the um, twenty-five to thirty. That's it. That's kind of a world average. Um, however, that excludes the shopping that happens via. Um, WhatsApp that I believe you mentioned earlier, where you know everyone has a number of their um, sales as uh, associate, and then they just type on a WhatsApp and get sold and delivered to your house in a, in an hour or so. So that's kind of excluded from that number. So I think we are quite similar to the rest of the world, but maybe more personal than uh, just going online on a platform and ordering. Um, however, the expectations are very high. Uh, we're seeing some of the shortest delivery times globally. Uh, mm -hmm. Many of the stores in um, Dubai or Kuwait or Doha, which are easy to serve, they're kind of city states, basically, um, they're delivering in two hours. Oh, two hours is kind of a standard, like you need to yeah. deliver in two hours. Um, but then you have even shorter. So we had 90 minutes, we have 60 minutes. Um, and then uh, we even had with one of our beauty chains called Faces, we had a 30 minute delivery. So we had a quick commerce, essentially, uh, for beauty items directly from the store. Um, that's one part. Um, the second part is it's very common indeed, which we see also in the rest of the world, um, that you order multiple pieces in multiple colors or sizes, you try to send it back. But when you have a one or two hour delivery, that's even easier to do, right? So in the morning, you order five dresses, you see which one is going to be the best this evening to go out and you return the rest. So there are a, bit, mm -hmm. there are, there are a lot of expectations on that. Um, in some of the, um, one of the key changes that we have also seen in digital is cash on delivery. So even though we're living in a very digital society, everyone is online, um, the highest consumption of um, social media globally, um, and so on. Uh, but we still see consumer that typically likes to pay cash on delivery, interestingly, even though everyone I think is banked. Mm -hmm. um, so um, what's interesting is that we saw a big change when the buy now, pay later was introduced. Uh, and that's kind of helped us a bit reduce the cash on delivery. But generally, there is a high expectation on uh, same day delivery, uh, having cash on delivery available, um, and then very high expectations when it comes to packaging. We have some some of the amazing um, um, players in the market doing really fantastic service. Um, and uh, they raised the bar for everyone else um, or what the customer That's almost on them. Japanese level of packaging. It's like impressively beautiful. And then also I would say that the the multiple pay on multiple times, you know, across the four without any kind of penalty has also helped change the game there. So finally, and then I'm going to open it up to questions. The, the big excitement about the future of the region and the luxury space, what are you most excited about? Where do you see the most potential? What's on the horizon for luxury? I think overall, as in the region, I'm the most excited about the social demographic changes we see we're seeing in Saudi Arabia and development in the country as a whole. And I'm really, really looking forward to some of the new mall openings um, in Riyadh um, and Jeddah that will hopefully take help us take the, the luxury to the next level in, in, in I think the last part of GCC where we were not able to 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 to, to yet achieve that level of, of luxury. I think in, in Qatar there was a a huge, um, huge improvement with the opening of the of the Vendôme Mall, and we now have some of the most beautiful flagship stores in the region. I'm really looking forward to see that also um, in um, in Saudi Arabia. Fantastic. Okay, let's see. I'm going to open it up the chat, and I'm wondering if I'm going to be able to get everything as I was off line here. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop from the, the bottom up. So are there any insights on the growth of the luxury retail market in the Middle East, especially with Gen Z from the region becoming more interested in sustainable and being responsible shoppers? Yeah, so the, the, the market as a whole in the Middle East is growing about 15 to 20 percent year and year um, ever since, you know, the, the 2020 drop happened. I think we're very blessed to have experienced growth um, last so in Q1 of 2021 we already recovered to pre-COVID levels and since then we have been growing. It's there are different dynamics by country, but on an overall level we are at about 
uh, plus 15 to 20% when we talk about fashion, so really fantastic. There is a substantial amount of spending driven by the G Gen Zs, uh, even more so because Gen Zs in this region often do have spending power, uh, which is not always the case um, in some of the other parts of the world, uh, which I think is working to our favor. They are looking for more innovative brands. I think maybe one thing we haven't mentioned before, we are probably also lacking in the region some concept stores, some top-notch concept stores that you will be able to find in um, um, in London or maybe even US, like if you go to Florida or there are some of the best concept stores globally, you can find in Miami. So we are we are a bit lacking that um, uh, that in Dubai uh, or in the Middle East as a whole, um, which does not really fully allow us to capture the, um, the the Gen Z opportunity when it comes to small brands. Uh, but yeah, we see we see generally um, a lot of new concepts, new trendy concepts launching that are very attractive to to younger um, younger crowd. Uh, what's also interesting, because I heard in the question, there was also a question about sustainability. We see increasing relevance of sustainability in the Middle East. Um, mm -hmm. And I think 75 to 80% of people at any customer survey we launch um, tell us that um, they are uh, very interested in uh, in um, sustainable products. And even the brand we mentioned earlier, the Giving Movement, is actually a sustainable brand with a, with a strong CSR link. However, uh, we are still seeing a bit of reluctance to pay for sustainability. So recently we've done a study on the watches and jewelry when we were asking consumers, are they willing to pay more for jewelry that has full traceability where the yeah. gold and diamonds come from? And we saw obviously Gen, Gen Z's being willing to pay for it. However, majority of people were still not. So they found it as a nice add-on, but the willingness to pay was not really there. Um, but it's changing. And we de definitely see that being uh, increasingly important for all the brands. Uh, fantastic. We Scarlett has sent a myriad of questions for you. We'll start with the top one. Um, clearly, it was the most important. Uh, when it comes to campaigns marketed in, in the MENA region, what are a few tips that you would give a brand that is trying to launch a product campaign collection in the region? So when we talk about marketing, I think it's very important to figure out the right localization. I think that's anywhere in the world. I don't think I'm saying I'm, 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 I'm saying anything very new. Um, Arabic is highly, is highly important. You will come to Dubai or you will go to Saudi, you will go to Kuwait. Everyone will speak English who you will speak with, and you will have a sense that you can just literally copy paste what has been done, um, somewhere else. It doesn't actually work. So the brands that have been highly successful, and then we're talking brands that maybe, I don't know, 20% of their global sales come from Middle East. So they're maybe more successful in Middle East than somewhere else are the ones who have managed really to crack this attachment to the local consumer without being any sort of, you know, cultural appropriation or anything, but really uh, being on the kind of on, on the on the border of uh, being localized while maybe not doing something that's not uh, true to the uh, to the DNA of the brand. Um, I think Arabic is definitely one thing, uh, very critical uh, overall for the market. If you were launching just Dubai, you can do it without Arabic, but as soon as you go outside of, of uh, UAE, you do need Arabic. It's a must. And second thing is you need to understand what, uh, who are the important celebrities, influencers, uh, people to put in your campaigns that will resonate with the local a local customer. Uh, we recently had a brand who was planning to launch with a global ambassador, uh, but the global ambassador, you know, might be relevant in US, but it does. People in the Middle East cannot relate to that That's person. True. So I think finding the relevant ambassador for this region. Um, is very important. And I think for that, uh, local knowledge is critical. Yeah, I absolutely uh, couldn't agree more to having uh, local ambassadors. And and also, I would say that there, there's such a, the influencer space here is so powerful and, and so and so influential um, that maybe isn't the case everywhere else in the world. In fact, in terms, this is another question, in terms of data and insight, is there anything in particular that you really need to measure for this region or any social media platforms that work better than others here? Is it, is it all about TikTok? Is it all about Instagram? Is, um, is it a, a mix of you know, all of that, or do you need to be on YouTube? What's the kind of, what are the metrics as it were? So uh, again, I think we have, when you measure it, you have a bit of a problem of, you know, averaging it because I think that's what we started with. You know, it's, it's one region, but multiple countries. So if you, if you ask me, what's, what's the most popular platform? My answer will be Instagram. What's the second one? TikTok. What's the third one? YouTube was the fourth one, Snapchat. However, if I break it down by country, it would be very different. Number one social media platform um, in Saudi Arabia across all generations is Snapchat. 
Um, but maybe we will. Sorry to interrupt. I'm kind of that shocks even me. So, okay. Yeah. According to all measurements, we do a luxury consumer. Yes. It's also linked to the fact that in Snapchat, it's easier to have closed communities, uh, which um, especially given maybe, you know, um, it's, it, many women do not feel comfortable showing their face. They don't feel comfortable having open profiles. So actually Snapchat still in any study we do in Saudi Arabia in particular gets number one place. Um, I think after that historically has been Instagram, obviously with a, with a Gen Z's and a younger, a younger crowd, um, there's more TikTok these days. So I think some of these things are very similar. Um, however, what's interesting is that the videos that people watch are, or, or, or content that they follow is not necessarily global. So they do follow global, but there is, I think, uh, Jessica, as you just mentioned, very strong influencer play local, and there's a lot of trust in the local influencers. So if a top global influencer publishes something that's great, um, but they, they might not get them to buy, it's going to be a nice insight. But if the local ones uh, publish, it usually really uh, results in, in solid conversion. And local influencers are not just traditional influencers you will see um, maybe in other places, which are uh, which are um, ladies and, and, and the men that focus only being basically an influencer or like an online model, if you, if you want to call them that way. But you also have folks who are influencers, but maybe designers, maybe they work uh, in, a, in a cultural association. So you have uh, basically professionals with their uh, with their with their professional careers but being very ingrained in the local society so being very influential when it comes to purchasing decision of the customers mm -hmm. and in terms of marketing to them um is it is it all about the visual is it all about the real is it all about video content or or are there other avenues that are more impactful or is it really do young do brands luxury brands or brands that want to break in um is that what they need to be focusing on that kind of visual storytelling yeah, definitely videos. Even before you know all the before the old all the TikTok mania and before all the um, uh, reels on Instagram and all that, uh, Middle Eastern consumer loved used to love the most uh, YouTube. They were the number one consumers of YouTube's global, YouTube globally. Uh, it was I think three hours and fifteen minutes on average per day. Um, mm -hmm. So which is yeah, which is a lot. So there is a culture of videos that comes from you know. Uh, maybe 10 years ago when I came to Dubai, it was already the highest penetration of Instagram globally. So, um, sorry, what YouTube globally. That's why mm -hmm. the consumer is used to videos and videos are critical. Photos are not, from a conversion point of view, they're not, they're not as impactful. Okay, interesting, interesting. Um, if there was any, you know, last, you know, piece of advice or wisdom, or, you know, if you could just shake everybody else in the rest of the world and tell them this is what you need to do, what would that be for, for them coming into the region? What is that kind of critical thing? I think for me, the critical thing is if for any brand looking to expand into region, I mean, I love Dubai. I live here. It's great. You should all come to Dubai, but please don't come only to Dubai. Um, any brands that comes, even though we're discussing all the markets, always come. Uh, we always meet them in Dubai, and you know, people are usually hesitant um, to, to to travel a lot. Um, if you're interested in entering Middle East, carve out one or two weeks and travel the region, and really see the differences, connect with the consumers, and try to understand the variety or diversity of people we have um, in this region and consumers we have, because really um, it is more diverse than what you will find. I don't know if you enter the market of same size, maybe Italy, um, mm -hmm. to use as, as, as an example, you will see the market much more diverse in terms of nationalities, in terms of people, tastes, uh, diff cultural differences and so on. So I think really deep understanding of the diversity of the region is critical. Um, and that for me would be maybe the the the, the main uh, message to any brand looking to grow, enter or expand in the Middle East. No, I absolutely agree. It's the boots on the ground is really the only way to, to understand how different a Saudi customer is to a customer who shops in Doha to somebody who's in, you know, an international person who, you know, lives or travels to to Dubai. Um, one last one last thing that I kind of wanted to touch on. I know there are a few brands that, you know, cater to the region. What what do you feel? Where do you feel that they're being successful? I know, you know, the, the sizing here is different. The weather here is different. Sometimes I look at some Western brands and I feel like they don't even understand that kind of aspect of, of the consumer here and why it needs to be so specialized. Do you, can you pinpoint where you're seeing some successes, the, the brands that are really paying attention? So I think the sizing is one thing that you mentioned. I think most brands that have been successful were, uh, you know, were, were, uh, were quite smart when it comes to sizing and, and, and merchandising. Um, 
That's I think that that's a given. Um, one thing that also made some of the brands um, successful, if I think about the market, is also understanding that. So, for example, we had a brand that entered the market and in their store, in their store layout, 20% um, were bags and 80% was ready to wear. And we were trying to explain to them that actually it's a market driven by bags and accessories, not just because mm -hmm. uh, early luxury consumer typically starts by that and only then goes to ready to wear, but simply because it's also a market with still many women, in particular local, would wear an abaya, would be open. So the bag still shows the most and the shoes. And this is, it's not just that it's a consumer doesn't buy ready to wear. It's just that they will buy probably, you know, one dress and three pairs of shoes and three bags. So the whole split in the store didn't make sense. Uh, but they simply used the approach which they which they had in 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 um, in other parts of the world where X percent of the store needs to be dedicated to some to to ready to wear. So I think understanding that is um, is also some of the you know um, uh, brands that have been successful have been managed managed to tailor their even global store concepts to the region to cater better for the customer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. I'm just going to see if there's any one last question. Actually, you know what? We're out of time. We're I'm I'm going to be you know on time as I should be here um, always. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time. I found this incredibly informative. I hope we get to do it again at the next um, at the next uh, summit because I'm sure between now and next year there will be so much advancement, so much change within what's going on in in the region. And I look forward to hearing your new insights in a year's time, hopefully. So Yasmina, thank you so much for taking that time. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Nice talking to you, Jessica. And thanks so much for organizing this panel. Thank you so much.